Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Uppercut Consulting's Q&A tonight. And what I'm going to be doing in just a few minutes is bringing my business partner, Dr. John Armando, on so that we could do uh, the Q&A together. Uh, we really appreciate all the comments, questions, and likes that we've been getting over the past couple of weeks, especially recently. And let me see if I could do this. I'm going to bring Dr. Armando to be here. We appreciate John, how are you? I'm good. So we made I'm here. Oh, I went, uh, I went, uh, I went gray beard. <laughs> Just to show that we're a little more mature than everybody thinks, because I know everybody thinks we're young and everything like that. I went Mr. Rock sweater for everyone today. Very nice. Uh, Very nice. Like that. Awesome. Hey. So I was just letting hey. everybody know that we appreciated them joining us tonight for our, our Q&A for our optometry and ophthalmology friends and clients. And um, we're really excited. We appreciate, you know, all the comments and questions, everybody that sent in questions to us. For tonight's Q&A, obviously we couldn't get to them all, but we took the first uh, 10 or 11 of them to, to get started. And we appreciate all the, the shares and, um, and please share this out to anybody else that might not be following us right now. You know, we, are, we appreciate it. We're trying to reach as many people as we can with um, the content that we have. So let's see, I think we have this kind of working here. Okay, Looks pretty good. I think we're centered. All right. Um, so the, the big thing of tonight, obviously, is that we are raffling off a one-week trial of our Uppercut Academy, and we're going to be doing that tomorrow, approximately uh, 12 noon. So what you should do is place your email in the comments so that we can enter you in the raffle. If you sent us a question, uh, you'll automatically be entered, but I would just double check and put your email at the bottom so that we could uh, tally them up tomorrow for when we uh, raffle off a one-week trial of uh, our Uppercut Academy that just launched. And so I think we should just get started, John. I know that the biggest thing that we've been getting is uh, a lot of people have been asking us, what, what do we really do? What does Uppercut Consulting <laughs> really do? Uh, yeah, because last time when we had our, our big conversation last time, we, you know, we spoke more about optometry as a whole and where we feel, you know, as though things are going and about independent uh, optometrists and things like that. But we, on purpose, we really didn't explain, you know, who we were about. Um, and, and we had some feedback on that, you know, about how, you know, there was a few people saying, well, why didn't you guys talk about yourselves? Um and, you know, we're careful on social media about this because, you know, we, we don't necessarily feel as though social media is the platform um, for, you know, necessarily selling your business. But there, there's nothing wrong with explaining to everyone, you know, what we do, um, you know, just in general. So, yeah, I agree with that. And I think we had the intent of, of if people – and clients and businesses are really interested in finding out more about us, they would go to our website or, or give us a call. But I guess we should give a little bit more background, you know, about ourselves and what we really try to provide for our clients. You know, I think that would be helpful based on a lot of the comments we've received and questions from people, you know. Um, I would say that the first thing that John, you know, for me, what we really focus on at Uppercut as a team, and, and we've put together a tremendous team of people um, that really have tons of experience in, in numerous different areas from social media to patient interaction, uh, you know, I mean, dealing with staff issues and, and business analysis, numerical analysis. So we're very blessed with who we have on our team and it, it's been really exciting, but the independent part for us is really what drives us. We are completely independent, no private equity uh, investors is just John and I that own the company. And I think that's a big thing. And we, we, the personalization part 
for us is, is really important. We want to get to know you as the business owner. We want to get to know your practices and, and, and what you do, because we don't believe in a, in a cookie cutter kind of mentality for your business. And we have clients that are not even in, uh, in the medical industry that we help grow their business. And obviously, if we can do that for them, obviously, we are gearing it towards, you know, the personal touch for your business. And I think that's what we've kind of went after with what we're doing. Yeah, like, you know, like you're saying, as far as the cookie cutter, um, you know, there, there's more, more than one consulting group out there. Um, you know, w there's Williams group out there. And, and when, when you're talking about cookie cutter, they, they talk about the Williams way of doing things. And, um, you know, although I'm sure they're, they're very, you know, they're good at what they do. Um, I, I kind of disagree with that whole Williams way thing because it, it doesn't, um, you know, like you said, there's no boilerplate here. Um, you can't just, you know, uh, put your beliefs on another practice and think that that's going to work or put your systems on a practice and feel as though that's going to work. There are certain fundamentals um, that work across the board. There's no doubt about that. But, uh, you know, as far as th this, this belief that everything can be solved in one way, um, I, you know, I know we don't really believe in that. Uh, you know, and it just depends on the practice itself. Uh, I feel as though, you know, what, you know, what we do in, in general is, is we, we know how to deal with things like staff turnover. We know how to deal with staff training. We know how to deal with office culture. Um, you know, we know how to deal with, with organized systems, you know, how to organize the systems in general um, and how to execute. Um, there are a lot of ideas out there, but as far as execution goes, uh, you know, we have, we have learned to do that very well. Um, so, you know, one of the, we, we keep coming back to pain points. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the reason why, I mean, I kind of look at this as, sort of phase two in our lives, probably. Uh, we've gone through our successes of, of building a successful practice, uh, you know, and personally, you know, families and making sure our children are great children. And, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a bunch of, you know, self-centered types of things, which a lot of people go through when they're in their 20s and 30s. And, um, Again, but, I guess you know, we're not in our twenties and thirties. Twenty-five, yeah, no. Uh, but you know, what, once at this stage, I, I'm pretty comfortable in saying that I feel as though we've, you know, we have that successful business at this point. Um, you know, and and our personal successes doesn't necessarily, I don't believe, fulfill us like it used to, um, which is why we you know, made this company. Sure. Um, this is now the new thing that gets me excited to wake up in the morning. Um, you know, we we're at this stage where we finally feel we have um, enough knowledge to help other practices become extremely successful. Uh, you know, and it's, kind of this giving back and sharing all of this knowledge with all of the other independent optometrists, ophthalmologists, you know, and, and like you were saying, really, um, you know, it, it goes beyond that sometimes. Uh, you know, th this is the, the phase two, I think, uh, of our life right now. Um, and uh, go, coming from office culture, um, staff turnover, which always happens. Uh, you know, we always have staff turnover. We still have a lot of staff turnover. But the thing is, is that we have the systems in place to deal with that turnover so that it doesn't become a negative um, influence into our business. Um, we don't pretend to know all the answers, uh, you know, and, and uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite.
And, and I feel as though that's what lends to what our success has been up to this point is that, you know, we, we talk about listening to new voices, you know, we pay attention to people outside of our, you know, our realm. We're, we're a lot of the time so inundated with optometry that, you know, we, we tend to forget that there are so many other people that can be influential to how, you know, to, to grow a successful business um, and just grow in general. Um, could be from a military standpoint, can, could be from a, a you know, um, financial business standpoint, could be from accounting standpoint, things like that. Uh, you know, so, so we, we feel as though it's our time, uh, since there's really not an independent type of practice development group out there. Um, it's our time to, to be able to really help and collaborate with other doctors. Um, so, so I feel as though we're, we're hitting it at a good point. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know I rambled on there a little no, bit. No, no. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think that's what sets us up, you know, really sets us apart that we really want to find out about our clients' pain points, no matter what field they're in, because everybody's pain points are different and we want to help them manage those pain points. If, Eliminate, well, that's great if you could eliminate them, but you never eliminate things completely as a business owner or entrepreneur, as we know. It, just when you think you have it under control, well, you know what happens in six months, it resurfaces. You know, you need to constantly monitor things and keep working on them. It's a repetitive, repetitive thing to have a successful business, you know, and, and goals too. For us, we want to know our clients, you know, business goals and their personal goals, because everybody has a different idea of what success is for them. And if they just want to grow their practice, we could put systems in pr place to do that, whether it's at a couple of patients a day, um, you know, hire an associate so that they could have, keep the revenue where it needs to be so they could have a little bit more time to themselves. You know, those are the things that we really focus on and the collaboration that you mentioned, I mean, if we don't know the answer, we point you in the direction of someone on our team or in our preferred partners that will get you that answer. And that's really what I think we're creating a network and we're going to learn from each other in our group, you know, and, and when you're members, we do have, you know, social media groups where we discuss things as an, as an open forum, which is, I think, you know, uh, a pretty special thing because when you could talk to others and get ideas and, and bounce things off in a positive, constructive manner, because everything we do at Uppercut Consulting, any client we deal with, you have to have a positive mental attitude towards your business, towards your clients and your patients. You know, we don't focus on the negative because they could just draw, as we know, so much time and energy out of you. Let's focus on the positive stuff, the growth, the good people, the good staff, the good coworkers that help grow your business, you know? Um, and I think that's what really sets us, you know, apart and where we go with things. You know, we do all this other stuff. You can look on our website that, you know, financial analysis and P and L's and we have, you know, you know, give us a call and we'll be happy to answer those more in depth questions. But I think, you know, I think we answered mostly gave you an idea of what people were asking for tonight to find out what we really do. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, the only other thing that we haven't mentioned, was, you know, is our, our um, online training platform that uh, we put together. And this is really going to be something, um, it, it's the first online interactive virtual training program uh, for optometry that, uh, you know, Scott and I have developed. Uh, again, all on our own dime. We're, we're not getting funded by anyone here. Um, but this platform, which has different modules, uh, it, it really, what it does is it will, uh, it will be able to give consistent uniform training um, throughout your staff and for the long term. And it's also accountable on the back end. Uh, again, you know, like Scott said, you, you can, you know, give us a call, look on our, our website for this type of thing. Um, and again, we're, we're giving away that, uh, yeah. that free the trial, um, you know, a, after this. So um, it's really something amazing. We, we, 
again, with the collaboration with other doctors, we are able to modify things and add certain things to this. Um, and uh, there's never been anything like this in optometry. We are extremely excited about it. Um, we're going to be rolling, you know, rolling it out pretty much during the next two conferences that we'll be at at, at Seco and at uh, Vision Expo East. So, uh, you know, we, we're thrilled to have that. Uh, we feel as though optometrists will will look at that as an extreme value overall. Sure. And um, just a reminder, if you put your email in the comments section below, you'll get entered in that raffle for the one week trial of our Uppercut Academy. And, um, and it does, you know, it can be outfitted, like John said, for numerous different, you know, fields, whether it's optometry, ophthalmology, uh, dental, medical, I mean, uh, it, it has HIPAA training, OSHA training in there, uh, the, the fundamentals, and we're very big on the fundamentals on how to greet a client or patient or how to answer the telephone and to make sure your staff is answering the telephone the same way. I mean, those basics are really um, the small details of what matters in, in a successful business, we believe. So a yeah, quick story on that. I just saw on LinkedIn about how um, Chick-fil-A, they said, is blowing away the competition because they say please and thank you. So you know, going back to these fundamentals and actually executing them, you know, two simple words that's, you know, they're blowing the doors off of all these other, yeah. you know, fast food chains um, because of please and thank you. Yeah. So, and it's things that we're working on at the office, but we're also, I'm working on with my children at home here. So it's, right. it's simple things that you start off with uh, at a very young age, you know, so, um, so we're going to get started. Um, we, we kind of took the top, I think it's 11 questions that kind of came up and uh, we were going to start addressing those. I think John was going to start off answering um, the first question that we had there. Yeah. First question here. Um, I'm just kind of reading here. It says, uh, do you agree with dropping managed care plans? So, to me, this is a mindset question. Um, first of all, I look at this as, well, are you busy? And do you have empty chair time? So if there's not patients in your chair, you should be taking every plan there is. Now, I know that there's the, the opposite view of this is that, well, we look at the cost of the chair time, the cost of the doctor seeing the and the staff and the electricity and all this stuff. Well, if there's no one in your chair and you know, you're know you still paying for all of this, you know, what's the, where's the question in that, you know? So I, I we've always been, you know, of the opinion of we want to be busy. Busy is good. Busy is not bad. Um, you know, and, and maybe not everyone agrees with that, but you know, that, that's the mindset we've always had. We want to be busy. Um, that's a great thing. Um, the opposite is not so great. So, um, you know, to, to accept all of these managed care plans. I know sometimes is eating some humble pie in the beginning because the reimbursement rates are terrible. Listen, we get it. We get that. Uh, but you have to understand maybe getting that patient in the chair, you might not be making that initial money right away, but maybe they have a medical issue. Okay. Maybe they have diabetes. Maybe they have glaucoma. Maybe their brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or sons and daughters have it and you do a great job with them and they refer them. We need to look at the big picture with managed care um, as far as, you know, not just that one exam fee, um, that, that vision exam that, that, you know, so many people think about. And we need to lead more in, into medical optometry in general. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I come from with that. Is if you're, if you have empty chair time, if your schedule is not full, um, then 
you should really be seeing everyone. Now, I can tell you that we don't see everyone. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of managed care plans that, that um, you know, vision plans we don't accept at this point, but it has taken years for us to get to that point. Um, and sometimes we are still hesitant on that. And we, we think, well, maybe we should bring this back or that back. Um, but, you know, it, it takes years to get the volume. And then once you have the volume, then you can kind of maybe chop away at certain things and, and um, you know, take the, the better paying vision plans and better paying, you know, managed care plans in general, um, medical plans, commercial health plans, things like that. Um, let me see if I have anything else written here on that. No, that's pretty much it about that. Um, the only know, thing I would uh, add to that would see if you, if you do have a specialty practice, you know, that would be an exception where you are, you have a, a niche in whether it's vision therapy or whether it's sports vision or, or something, you know, um, sclerals, RGPs, you know, for, for our, our medical eye field clients that are listening tonight, those are the ones that I would say that that is an exception to what we kind of believe in that. And that's, you know, um, and those are the minority at this point. So that's why we're talking to the general. Right. And we'd rather be, we'd rather be busy three days, really full, than spread out over five, because it helps your patients when they come in and they see your staff moving and they see you busy. They're like, wow, this is a busy place. It has life. And they're going to go tell other people that, you know, that place is really rolling, you know. And uh, yeah. so the perception of patients and clients in the community is very important to that. So it's better to have three days and be real busy and take the other day to work on your business, to grow your business with, with ideas that you never get to during the day. Um, so I think that's what we've kind of put together over over the years and we've you know learned from others and have implemented in our own practice so um question two would be <clears throat> how should a staff member be disciplined if they are late for work so obviously a very big topic is attendance and lateness and you know i think all of this comes down to your core values as a company and what's important to you and your staff and your management, you know, and it has to be carried out by everyone. And it starts at the interview process. You know, when you're interviewing someone for a job, you have to make sure that their core values and them as a person match your business's core values. And if, if attendance and showing up on time for the interview process is not important, well, I got news for you. It's not going to get any better at all. Okay, it only gets worse. They might do well for the first 30 days. But then after that, the true person starts to evolve and show itself, you know, so, but for us, we take care of a lot of issues with this with, you know, our clinical director who does a great job in putting our policies together, along with our management team and, and really it comes down to your employee handbook, you really need to have a very well documented employee handbook that describes what you do for tardy or late employees. And it's just, it's a universal thing. If you treat everyone the same and it's there in writing, there can't be this whole argument of like, oh, you didn't do it for this employee or you did something for that employee. That's what the manual is there for. And I know some people are like, I don't need a manual, I only have three people. Well, if you have anybody besides yourself, you should have an employee manual to protect yourself as a business owner and to protect your culture. So, you know, for us, some offices give grace periods anywhere from one to five minutes or some give zero. Uh, they don't give a grace period. That's up for you to decide, but that needs to be in there. And then we're, we've always been a believer in kind of the three step rule where it's, you know, a warning, um, and then something a little bit more significant if it happens again, and then you're open to termination if it happens a third time. But these are things you have to have discussions with and document all of those discussions with this employee if this is going on. And you need to do that for everyone. You can't document for one and not for another. You just need to be consistent with it. And you should always, when you're documenting and talking to an employee, you should always have a witness in there, we believe, 
um, just yeah. as an objective person to observe the conversation. So, and those are just things we've learned over time, and, we, and we've, we've, you know, met with attorneys and very successful business owners and, and, and just, you know, implemented in our own practices at our companies. So that's where I would, I would go with that on the, on the tardiness. We, we do have three times is really the, I don't like to call them strikes because there are, you know, extenuating circumstances. You know, if you have, you know, someone passes away and things, those should be included in your handbook as exceptions because those are unfortunate things that obviously do happen in people's lives. So um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, John, or. Well, the only other thing I was thinking of was um, uh, we, we do a great job with this, with our staff. Um, but in the recent years, we were, you know, as far as associate doctors go, um, sometimes we would tend to, you know, n not deal with them in the same exact way as we would with the staff um, because you assume certain things. And, and um, I can say that that's not the way to go. We, we, we've been through that. Um, so you really have to treat, you know, associate ODs, everyone exactly the same um, across the board. And the documentation is absolutely huge. Um, you know, you want to be real people uh, for certain situations, you know, like you were saying, if there's death in the family, if there's things like that, obviously, um, you know, you're going to make exceptions for certain things. But um, as far as the 95% of other issues, um, you really have to be the same across the board with that. It's the consistency um, and, uh, you know, having having everything documented, having files, uh, you know, for, for all of your employees and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so question number three, I, I absolutely love. Um, it is how long should it take to see a comprehensive eye exam? So this question comes about with a, you'll see it on you know the Facebook optometry groups things like that um, and they're great you know the, some of the some of the optometry groups on Facebook are made like you know fit, uh, ODs on Facebook is fantastic um, you know but we uh, they do a great job Dr. Glazer does an unbelievable job um, with trying to you know deal with that massive group. Um, what we have to realize here is, you know, social media, there, there's a reason why they call it that, you know, it's social. Um, so if you're looking to get answers to really important questions through some of these groups, you, you really have to watch that. Um, some of the answers could be quick and, and that's what, you know, these groups are great for. Um, but other answers, it depends on the practice and you're going to ask these questions like how long should it take to see a comprehensive eye exam? And it completely depends on what type of practice you have. Um, so I'm just going to speak from a well delegated optometry practice. That's where I'm coming from here. I feel as though we could see a comprehensive eye exam with a, uh, an on-point delegated optometry practice between 7 and 15 minutes for a comprehensive eye exam. Now, again, the doctor is doing what the doctor needs to do. You know, the doctor is not taking history. The doctor is not doing all the pre-testing. The doctor is not showing them their glasses. You know, this is... This is highly delegated, um, seven to 15 minutes. So, you know, we look at our doctors at, at our practice and, and they need to be seeing between 25 to 35 patients in a day in total. And that includes comprehensive follow-ups, contact lens, you know, exams in general. Um, as far as, and I know the question wasn't follow-ups, but I'll just, might as well just say that. I mean, you can see a follow-up in three to five minutes. Um, you know, 
you have to understand that patients don't care how long you're in the room with them for. They want their, their questions answered. They want their problems solved. And that's what they want. And they want to get on with their day. Um, and you can be a phenomenal eye doctor and do that super efficiently. Uh, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions there. And, and I feel as though, um, you know, with, you know, with our clients, you, you have to tread lightly a little bit because the expectation there isn't the same all the time. Um, however, uh, busy is relative, um, but, you know, you and I, Scott, we, we see, you know, we saw 30 patients a day, no problem. Um, for a long, long time. So, um, and again, we are highly delegated, but you know, you, you have to like to work a little bit. It's not, it's not, that, it's not that bad of a thing. You know, you can look at it uh, again, everything is mindset. So again, I, I feel as though seven to 15 minutes, depending on the patient, if you're going longer than that, um, <laughs> I did a little thing with, with um, I don't know if it was our clinical director or uh, our, um, our office or our clinical manager, where we just did a stopwatch and we just let it go for 15 minutes to see how long of a period. And we just sat in our office and I started the stopwatch and we just sat there for 15 minutes to see how long of a time that really is. And it's a long time. <laughs> 15 minutes is a long time. So you don't need to spend an hour with a patient. You don't, you know, uh, unless you're doing everything, um, you know, which is what we try to help people not do. We, we try to help our doctors not do everything. Um, you know, that's, you, you need to be in that seven to 15 minute range um, for the comps. So I don't know if you, yeah. you, you <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree. Well, you saw it faster than me, so I don't know what you want. <laughs> you know, I, I definitely agree with that, you know, and um, and if you look at a lot of the reviews that we see in the medical field on social media, well, they always mention something about the wait time or how long they were there, and especially in optima optometry and ophthalmology, because we do dilate patients, the exams take longer, you know, that is one of the most common threads that I see to a lot of these negative reviews is the time they spent there, you know, and especially younger generational patients. Yeah. They, they want to be in and out. They don't want to. They want to leave before me. they even. Came. No, they don't want to come <laughs> hang out with me and you for an hour and a half at, at oh. our office. So, um, so we need to change with, with the times. And obviously, again, it, it is a little particular to your individual practice, you know, and we are speaking about a highly delegated protocol. But with the reimbursement rates the way they are, it's kind of hard not to go to a, a highly delegated protocol to, to make the same, if not maybe a little bit more um, yeah. than you've made previously. So uh, question four. Do you bill patients if they don't have the money at the time of the service? So we do not bill patients if they don't have the money at the time of the service, whether it's for their exam, their copay, special testing. We just took a policy years ago where we tried the other way. We would send bills. We would try to chase the money. We were paying too many people to chase the money that we did not receive. And it just was not worth it, and, you know. And so we made, we did it. A, it was just a cost analysis of how many people we were paying to chase the money and versus the return of actually how much we were getting. And it's on our postcards. It's on our phone calls. Like they always know that if they're coming in for special testing, they have a copay or deductible that they need to bring it at the time of their visit. And over years, it's taken time, but it very rarely becomes an issue now. It still happens because if there's a test you need to order on the spot, they don't have that or they don't have their credit card, 
then you do have to bring them back for that, you know, and, and we try not to do that, but it just makes it a lot easier for our staff and for the patients. We believe in communicating with them up front. I mean, I think, I think we are, are basically, you know, managed care, social workers at the front desk. Our staff does such an amazing job at telling everybody and explaining their deductibles and what they cover. And, and you do have to take, we believe, that extra step because that's what builds that trust with your patients and your clients going forward, that you care about them. And this is confusing. I mean, it changes every year. And they could have one insurance one year and they could have a completely different one the next year. And that's the other reason why we believe in trying to keep everybody involved in your practice and not eliminating them based on their insurance because there's so much movement going on in the industry right now. So, um, and it is a written policy that we do have for our staff so that they know for the, our patients also. So you, you need to sometimes put these policies in writing so that everybody understands the importance of them so that they are followed through on a consistent basis by everybody, whether they were hired last month or they were with you for 17 years, you, know, yeah. you, you need to revisit those things. So I think that's really, you know, an important way of looking at it. And then somebody actually emailed me and said, well, I just use a collections agency. And collections agency, in this particular case, I think that they were taking, I think it was 40 to 50% of whatever was received. So you're taking them, you're not collecting the money while you have them in your office at that time. And then you're just gonna say, we're gonna bill you. And then when they don't pay, you're gonna go hire a collections agency that you're gonna give 40 to 50% of whatever they collect away if they get it. I just think it's better to take the money up front instead of give away half the money possibly that you would get on the back end. Um, and there might be ones that do more competitive rates, but that's another time consuming thing. And then you're sending a negative culture and community builder out there that you are sending a collections agency after your patient. And you, absolutely, you know, you don't want yeah. to be doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how we handled that and have done that over, I guess we're 17 years now. So, yeah, the only thing we do do is we do do kind of like a layaway for glasses and contacts and things like that, where they can leave deposits down, but they can't take the glasses or contacts until they're fully paid. Uh, but they can place the order and we get the order rolling, things like that. So it, it's pretty much like a layaway program for our patients that can't afford to put the whole thing down at once. And we'll get the order rolling for them. Sure. But, um, so next is how much vacation time uh, do you give a new hire? Um, we have, I mean, you, you can really go a lot of different ways with this, but uh, how, how we do it, we have three days after six months, uh, which is, you know, if you're, they're eight hour days. So you're looking at 24 hours. We have five days after one year, which is 40 hours. We have 10 days after two years. So these are, you know, these are work weeks. So it's, you know, after a year, it's one work week. After two years, it's two work weeks. After six years, it's three work weeks. Um, you know, and, and, and also we need to submit uh, vacation four weeks in advance. So that's one thing that we do ask uh, of our, our team is to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, that four weeks in advance gives our, our clinical director and our managers time to, you know, be able to look at coverage and, you know, and whatnot. Um, as far as holidays and things like that, I mean, uh, I won't get into that, but, um, you know, for, for time's sake, but if you have questions on that, you can obviously email us um, as far as how our holidays go um, for full-time, for part-time, and, and, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. I mean, again, it's something that's just, you know, written out and, you know, communicated in a very open fashion right from day one, you know, so that everybody right. knows what to expect. It's all about expectations and communication, you know, and 
setting. And in the employee manual, you know, you yeah. want that in there. Exactly. All right. So that was number five. Um, all right. Number six. Were you? Oh, that's me. Again. Oh, that's you. All right. There you go. I'm looking at it. Like, uh, what is your turnaround time on glasses? Again, we like to set a standard. So we do a lot of our own edging um, because we have a larger practice. So we, you know, we're looking at about two to three days. Um, if we edge the job, we're looking at a, about a week. If, if an outside lab edges the job, you know, does the job in about two weeks for a VSP um, IMED. So, uh, you know, in general, this is the type of thing where you want to always under promise over deliver. This is key to that. You don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're saying, Oh, I think we can have this done, you know, here or there, you know, you don't want your staff. You want your staff to be the same across the board with, with the response to this. Cause this is huge. If, if the glasses aren't done and they expect them to be done, these are the things that create bad reviews. So um, always be conservative with this. Um, it's extremely important. Um, you know, we, we deal with a great lab. Uh, we deal with uh, Luzerne Lab out, out uh, Luzerne Optical Lab out of uh, Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, they do a fantastic job of getting the jobs back to us very quickly. Um, but, you know, if they don't, we also have you know, our, our um, optical manager deal with, you know, Luzerne and make sure that things are going, you know, smoothly overall. So you, you, you need to have your finger on the pulse of things. Um, it's extremely important. We don't want uh, patients to get mad because their glasses aren't ready. So, um, you know, th those are, those are kind of our, um, our things. We may, we may be considering doing one hour service. We're starting to talk about that, but again, this is a whole different level thing. And, um, you know, we, we need to make sure we're all on the same page before we do something like that. And, and I advise uh, all of you to do the same because one hour service could be, um, a touchy situation. You have to make sure you're able to do it. Um, but I think that's all, all for that one. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, if, if you're, you know, delivering the glasses in a couple of days, I mean, if you tell them four or five and you're getting them two or three, they're going to be really surprised. And there's a lot of great companies that have, uh, really skyrocketed based on that premise of things. So, uh, always surprising to the upside and positive side. Uh, they'll be really happy and tell others about that, you know? So uh, number seven would be, how often do you look at your P&L? So I'm gonna tell you that we look at our P&L very often. <laughs> uh, seems like multiple times a week right now. Uh, <laughs> I do look at our bank accounts. We look at our bank accounts on a daily basis. And yes, I do a mean Saturday and Sunday. I'm a very big believer in of, I want to know what we're actually receiving from our payments, credit card companies, um, insurance companies, obviously, and so forth. I want to make sure the deposits are getting in when they're supposed to. And that's really important for us planning out what we do each week with payroll of so many people of, you know, just under 60, 50 some odd people at this point. So um, we look at the accounts. I want to know what money is coming in. But we also look at the P&L, but you need to look at your P&L. I would think worst case scenario once a month to make sure right. how you did that month, because you will be able to detect trends on if something is off and you could address it and fix it. Because if you wait three or four months, it could have been simply like somebody wasn't ordering something the way they were supposed to, or somebody got trigger happy with the ordering. And you don't want to find out that months after when you could have really found it out very quickly and saved yourself a, a big headache and number of dollars. So that's kind of how we approach that. So I would say worst case scenario, once a month and you should be able to go through it 
And we've talked a little bit about some protocols where you want to budget too. You want to know what you're spending because you know at certain times of the year, depending on your industry, uh, you know, for, for, for us, fall and spring tend to be a little busier um, than other times of the year, but we're having a mild, we're having a mild winter right now up in the Northeast. So we've, we've been really, January was very busy for us and, and February is continuing that way. So um, you need to stay on top of your finances. And I'll, you know, whether it's business wise or personal wise, I, I think it's, you got to monitor them on a consistent basis, you know? Yeah. So number eight is how often do you have staff meetings? Uh, I love meetings. <laughs> The, um, no, I actually did. We, we, we've changed. I used to hate meetings because we used to do them. That's why I hated them. But, um, so we have a whole office meeting once a month. We have, um, uh, a manager's meeting. I believe that's once a month also, Scott, right? I think it's, I think it's a manager's only meeting once a month. I don't think they do that every week. I think it depends uh, on the time of the year. Sometimes if it's busy that I think a little more maybe. Yeah, I think our director does run him maybe on, on once a week during busier times. He might space them out when it's a little bit more. Yeah. You know. JT, if you're watching there, you may you can put that on our uh, on the live there and, and, and tell me what uh, what you, you're doing for that. Um, as far as the, the department meetings, I think are once a week also. Mm -hmm. So we have separate apart, uh, departments and, and um, we have those meetings. But we also have an owner's meeting with our clinical director once a week. So Scott and I speak with our clinical director to see how it, you know, our, our office at Westminster Eye Care is doing um, and making sure we're involved in that. Um, and there are many ways to do this. I mean, you know, you can, you can, you know, we read the Ritz Carlton books and they have the, the five minute daily meetings. There are many ways to do it. And, and, and there's a lot of right ways, but if, if I want anyone to take anything out of this question, it's that the meeting should be positive and productive. We used to have our meetings and we used to start with, okay, does anyone have any problems that they want to let us know about um, from patients and, and blah, blah. And that was the worst possible thing to do. I mean, this, this was years ago and then that's how we would start our meeting. What problems does everybody have? And then it would just turn into a big disaster. Everybody would talk about the problems that were going on and this patient this and this employee that and nothing ever got done. So it's much more important to keep these meetings productive um, and positive uh, and to celebrate great things that happened in the office. Um, our clinical director does an amazing job with you know, celebrating the things that our office does well, because we tend to not do that. Um, it's one of his biggest strengths overall. So, you know, in general, we, even if the meetings have to become trainings, yeah. I would rather it be a training um, than just a, a, a soundboard of negativity overall. So that, you know, that's a huge thing. If you're having office meetings about all the things that you've done wrong, it, 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 it's, it's not helping you. You just need to stop that and figure out what's going wrong yourself and then start training up, you know, and training your, your staff to make things better. Um, you know, that's the better approach on that. Yeah. I mean, it's just about protocols and solutions to things to try to help improve the culture of your coworkers and the experience for your clients and patients, you know, and, and, you know, I'm a really big believer in the five to 15 minute meeting and then the rest <laughs> should be training. Uh, and, and, and I just, if you research it, really we could only process a couple of things and then it's like two, I'll give you three maybe, but I believe in two, I can barely process one. There you go. Okay, so you're going to have a meeting and then you're going to come up with all these ideas, but you can only have so much time to execute on those 
for the next week or the next month and to do it the right way from A to Z. And that's why I'm a believer in one or two points, five to 15 minutes and really just be like, okay, let's focus on that. We'll follow up on it. And, and that's what I kind of, you know, believe. Yeah. The follow-up is huge and the consistency is it, it, sure. it, just huge. Yeah. All right. So number nine, a little bit more technical question. Does your office pre dilate? As John mentioned, we are a highly delegated office and we do pre dilate our patients. Um, they are pre dilated by one of our medical assistants when they are being pre tested. And there is a written protocol on what they are supposed to do in the exact order for pre testing. So we do pre, pre dilate our patients. And we only use 1% tropicamide. If anything else is needed for diabetics and stuff, that is prescribed by the doctor later on, you know, in the exam port uh, portion of things. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, insurance is collected in the front and then the medical assistant takes them to the pre-test room. And that's where, and we always ask the patient's permission, obviously. You don't just put the drops in. We asked their permission that they could do that. And I'll tell you, our acceptance rate is very high and it makes the exam, you know, go very smoothly. It cuts down on their time there. And, you know, we've had very little issues with it over the years uh, from when we switched to that. We do check before, you know, pupils and their IOP to make sure if they are, there's two exceptions, you know, if their pressure is 30 or higher on the pretest, we do not dilate them. And if they are plus four hyper open or over, we do not dilate them to be on the safe side that is determined by the doctor in the exam room again. So those are how we approach, you know, the pre dilation portion of things. And, um, you know, and then I know there's always the whole I'm sure your remake skyrocketed. Well, I'm going to tell you that our remakes did not budge. So, and I, I, I give credit to our doctors because of their, they noticed that if it's, if they're not a hundred percent on that refraction, then, you know, they'll discuss it with the patient and they might have to bring them back for an RX check or, you know, or we use a, a trial frame, which is one of the other questions, but um, you know, it's just about communication. You know, and if you're if you're running on time and your team is running on time, it works very well, I think, you know. Yeah, I, I love this question because I, I actually and like you said, we do pre dilate um, and I was one of those that was kind of on the fence with that and, and didn't know if that was really going to work with, you know, our systems. Um, and uh, I was completely wrong on that uh, and how uh and, and i love that you know th you know these these are the things that um i think make us more successful is to try things that you know how do you know you're right uh you, you think you're right all the time but how do you really know you're right and once we had the discussion with the other doctors and everyone kind of sat down and you know we, we we came up with that decision um you know you, you have to leave your ego at the door and, um, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to come up with the best answer all the time. So I'm so glad we did the pre-dilation. And I thought it was unbelievable once we were doing it as far as even like retinoscopy and things like that go. Um, and I, I think we find more information than without doing it, you know, in the beginning. There you so go. That was my two yeah. cents. Um, just a reminder, um, please put your email in the comment section below to enter your name and your practice in for a uh, one week trial of Uppercut Academy. Uh, we'll be doing that drawing tomorrow. And um, if you weren't on the beginning and you just caught us, you're driving home, depending if you're on the West Coast or not, uh, please put your email in there. Uh, we appreciate you guys watching tonight with us. So uh, as we finish up, I, I led into the, the next one where it was uh, how often do we trial frame patients? And, you know, we utilize it still in our office because it makes our doctors feel comfortable with what we're doing. Uh, we don't utilize it. It's a very small percentage of our patients that we do it on now. Uh, you know, and uh, if there's a big change with prescription, 
cylinder axis or something different than what they were wearing. I think that's when our docks and we would utilize it, you know, in the past. But the one thing that John and I, I think, are, are always believers in, that we want our patients to leave happy with their vision. So you don't have to solve the world and make a uh, huge change in their glasses because you know the chances of them coming back and it being too strong or uncomfortable. You might have to just communicate with them that you're going to change it in stages. And whether it's in three months or six months, you're going to give a little change at a time. But again, I just think that comes down to communication between the doctor and the staff because the optical staff is, is very important in communicating that also, you know, um, and your team, you take care of your patients and your clients as a team. So communication is really the key there, I think, when it comes to trial framing it, but it is a small percentage in our office, even with the volume of what we see. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so we have our, our, our last question. Is it midnight yet? How long are we going to do this? I don't know. It's going on pretty, pretty <laughs> long. Yeah. Um, so the last question is a little bit lighthearted. It says, did you ever hear of the movie Toy Story? Um, so that, that's, that's actually our own question. We, we sort of did a little bit of kind of an inside joke on this. Um, but uh, the, you know, most of us are going to say, well, absolutely, I've heard of the movie Toy Story. Uh, but again, you don't realize how many people maybe have not heard of the movie Toy Story and don't have a clue of what it is. So we... Um, you know, we, we, we hired someone at, at some point in our, in our uh, career a long time ago, um, and this situation came up, and it was afterward that, you know, we didn't necessarily come out and ask that question, but it was something that was referred to, um, and, you know, the person that we had hired said, well, I don't even, I, I've never heard of that movie before, I don't know what you're talking about when it came to Toy Story. So the, the issue was, was that this person had to deal with a lot of children um, on a daily basis. And, you know, in, in general, overall, um, unfortunately it didn't work out. So really moral of the story here is that, you know, you may assume that people have heard of certain things or do certain things or say certain things, um, but, you really can't assume that. Uh, so when you're hiring for someone, you have to really make sure you ask the right questions. Um, ask the right questions for the position. It's extremely important. Um, they, they have uh, really great personality tests out there also, which I know we're going to get more into um, and, and I feel as though it's going to be uh, a huge help to, to our, our practice. Um, since, again, we have over 50 people working for us um, in all different areas. Um, and we need to know, you know, what kind of a person are they? You know, are they, are they introverts? Are they extroverts? Are they, you know, people that can execute? Are they, you know, uh, dreamers? Are, you know, uh, are, are they planners? Are they innovators? You know, what are they? Um, and we can't just assume that everyone thinks like we do. So, um, you know, as far as have you ever, you know, have you ever heard of the movie Toy Story? I have. I have plenty of children. Um, but again, uh, just, just don't assume things. Don't assume things. And that's a point for us. Like you said, it was us, learn, uh, again, learning about hiring the right person. Yeah for the position we needed it. It's not anything about someone that doesn't know Toy Story, obviously. Uh, right, right. You know, it, it's not meant that yeah, way. Very intelligent person. And, and, but as far as the fit goes, you know, the fit just wasn't right. And, and that's our fault. Yeah. That's, that's not their fault. No. So, you know, you have to own up to that. And, and we, we needed to own up to, you know, our, you know, our weakness as far as not being able to ask the correct questions, you know, to, to the, uh, you know, to the position that we needed. Sure. And it's something that we've learned over time. 
Um, and if you can do that, I mean, that's what it's all about. If you could bring in the person with the right expectations and ask the right questions, you're giving them the best opportunity to be successful at their position, you know, and that's our job as, as business owners and coaches and, and consultants to, to set people up to succeed, you know, and we need to do the best job of that. So, um, again, you know, drop your email down below in the comments to be entered in our one week raffle for the uppercut Academy trial. And, you know, even between now, and if you're catching this on replay tonight, tomorrow, do it before, I think the cutoff is probably going to be by noon time tomorrow, Eastern standard time to make sure I got that right. Um, please come visit us. I know uh, we will be uppercut. Uh, Jason, our vice president and I will be in Las Vegas this week for a business conference. And, if you are watching this and you want to come and meet us, we would love to chat with you or give us a call while we're out there. And, and then we go to Atlanta as a team. Our whole team will be in Atlanta. Uh, and, uh, and then we have Vision Expo East in New York City, uh, back at the, the home place a little bit, which I'm pretty excited for every time we go back there. So we have a, a busy schedule. So please come out and, and meet us in, in person. We would love to meet with you and chat with you about your business and, uh, and get to know you a little bit about it as a person, you know. Um, I want you to you know, wish you a great week. And I'm going to tell you to make it a great week because it's up to you to decide how you act on things. And if you act in a positive manner, you can definitely uh, go one foot in front of the other and make it a great one. So you guys have a great night. John, do you have anything to add? I was just, you know, again, we'll be at uh, Seco in Atlanta and, uh, and then Vision Expo East. Um, we're looking forward to, to speaking with all the, uh, you know, all the docs there, uh, office managers, staff members, um, you know, everyone in the eye care industry. Uh, we are really excited to, uh, you know, to just collaborate with everyone. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, we wish everyone a great night. We do. You guys have a great one. We'll see you soon.